everybody. Welcome to the podcast. It may interest you to know. I'm Tony Ann Marcolini. And my very special guest today is a legend in the music industry. Uh, he's <laughs> one half of the rock band Air Supply, who've been selling out concert venues since the 1980s. Uh, Rolling Stone Australia named them in the top 50 greatest all-time uh, artists. Uh, so I'm honored today uh, to welcome Graham Russell to the podcast. Welcome. Thank you, Tony. How are you? I'm good. Uh, so, you know, I I didn't realize that you had met your uh, your counterpart, your 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 the other half of the band, um, in in rehearsals for uh, an, a musical that you were both working on together, uh, and in doing research for today, uh, I found that out. There comes a point in time, though, that outside that meeting, uh, you guys start to get together to rehearse what is music you've written. Yeah, we did. Yeah, uh, yeah I met Russell on the first day of rehearsal, and uh, it, it was quite, quite an, an interesting story. I just happened to sit next to him uh, without knowing him, and in the first, when the, the, the chorus first sang, I just heard this incredible voice next to me and I was so moved that after that rehearsal, I turned to him and I said, wow, what a great voice you've got, you know, and I introduced myself and he introduced himself and we realized we had the same name. So straight away, we had some kind of affinity because we were the only two people in the whole cast that didn't know anybody else, you know, in theater. You, yeah. In theater, Everybody knows everybody, but we were the two green guys. So we kind of drifted together. We sat next to each other in the, in the court, men's chorus room, uh, which was by chance. And so we became friends. We, we were both born in June. We both saw the Beatles when we were 14 years old. So we had all this kind of weird stuff going on. And we started to sing together after a few days, you know. It was amazing. Now, when's the point in time when you think, you know, yeah, there's some magic to this? It was straight away because, you know, I'm a songwriter that sings. I'm not a lead singer. And so I've always known that. And I've always been waiting and wanting to work with a great singer. Um, and when we started singing, something happened. And we never planned it anything. Like if I would bring a song to Russell, even in those early days, I would just play it to him and he would jump in straight away and he would find a harmony or he would say, let me sing the melody and you sing the harmony. And we wouldn't even work it out. It was just there. And it was so easy for us. It was almost like it was predestined, you know. And we, we were having so much fun. And we said, oh wow, this is fantastic. We're having a great time. We're in Superstar, so we're getting paid, so we can work on something uh, so that when the show ended, we knew it was going to run for at least 18 months. But our goal was to have something together where we were working together by the time the show ended. So that was our goal. We were on a mission, you know. You ultimately recorded uh, Lost in Love, and it started climbing the charts in Australia. And then Clive Davis uh, of Arista Records signed you here in America um, for the, mm. you know, for, the, for you know, after hearing the same song, and you started climbing the charts here. Uh, do you remember those early days uh, when you first learning that you were you were climbing your way up to one of what would be several, you oh. know, top hits? Yeah, yeah. Well, I do very well. We, you know, we came to the U.S. in '77. We, were, we opened for Rod Stewart for six months and nobody knew who we were. But we thought, oh, wow, we, there's a strong chance we could break wide open in the US, you know, which meant the rest of the world. And we, it didn't happen. But I, it was a good thing it didn't happen because we weren't ready. You know, we, the band was only six months old at that point. We weren't ready. Uh, so we came back to Australia and they'd forgotten about us and we had to start again and we started again i wrote lost in love uh, all out of love 
and they were big hits in Australia, but nothing else happened. Um, and having a big hit in Australia doesn't mean anything. It means you can tour in Australia uh, that has, you know, six major big cities. Uh, but in the course of the United States, there are hundreds, hundreds of them. So nothing was happening. And in the end, we almost gave up because we played everywhere we could play. We were broke. And uh, we, we said to ourselves, well, we, we're broke and we've had two big hit songs in Australia. W what happens now? What happens now was we needed to get out of there. And as luck would have it, uh, Clive Davis somehow heard Lost in Love and uh, he bought the, the license to release it. And, you know, I was in England trying to survive, trying to sell songs. And I, I get a phone call from Clive Davis and he said, is this Graham Russ? I said, yeah. And he said, this is Clive Davis, you know. And I went, oh my God. And he said, <laughs> uh, we're releasing Lost in Love. He said, where are you? I said, well, I, I'm in England. He said, you need to get back to Australia and record the album because this song is going to be the biggest hit you've ever seen. And, we, and he was right. So we went back to Australia. I went back to Australia and I got together with Russell again and we recorded the first album, you know. But we had, we, we had the songs and we had Russell's voice and, and we knew it was going to happen, but we didn't know how big and how long. <laughs> <laughs> And you have so many songs in the top five. I think you were you equaled or you parallel the Beatles. Um, I know. Yeah. <laughs> when, when we when we heard that, we were thinking, "Oh my God!" To be mentioned in the same sentence as the Beatles was the biggest thrill for us, you know. But, uh, but we had a, a lot of stuff going on, and we were ready for it. In 1980, we were ready. In 77, we weren't, but we were ready, and we were ready for a, a new place and to to be on the world stage you know we just wanted that and we thought that was a great opportunity for us but you know we had no idea it would last so long uh, but you know you couldn't turn a radio on in those days without hearing one of our songs you just couldn't it was impossible that's absolutely the truth yeah, amazing. <laughs> and, and there came a yeah. point in time that you, you performed for Princess Diana as well we did. It was a command performance in 1988. And that was, it was like a, being in a fairy tale. I mean, you know, I come from a very working class town in the middle of England, where most people end up going down the pit because it's a big coal mining town. So anyone that ends up doing a command performance for, for royalty, it's like unheard of. It just never happens. And I, I remember being in the line and um, Princess Diana spoke to Russell first because he was to my right. And I, I, I was shaking. I thought, my God, here's Princess Diana. I'm, she's going to talk to me any <laughs> second. <laughs> and she said, she spoke to Russell for like two minutes. And then she said, oh, hello, you know. And I, you know, you do that, you bow. And she says, I've got two of your albums. And I said, oh, my God, you know. So the ice was broken already. So it, it was just, you know, a, a wonderful moment that will never be repeated, obviously, you know. Oh, I would think that's probably one of the moments, your most memorable moments, like burned in your brain. It, it does. And I was so, I was very proud and very happy and... Uh, I wish at that point my mother was there to have seen it, but but she wasn't, you know. Yeah. I and I heard that you play because you of course you play the guitar and you uh mm. and you your songwriter, very talented songwriter. Is it true that you play the, the right-handed guitar upside down? I do, yes. I'm left-handed. Uh, but when I when I learned guitar when I was I was 13, I couldn't afford my own guitar, so I had to borrow one. And when I borrowed it, it was just a Spanish guitar from my neighbor. I, I picked it up the wrong way. I picked it up like I would uh, a baseball bat. And I played it that way. And all the chords I learned were all, were all wrong, but I didn't realize it till I learned them all. Uh, 
because if I look at a book, I see the chord A minor, for instance, I just copy it. And for me, that's the right way. But then later on, someone said to me, you know, oh, you're playing the guitar wrong. It's all upside down. And I said, oh, OK. But it was too late for me to change. But what it gave me, it gave me a different sound. Like uh, if you listen to the, the beginning of Lost in Love and All Out of Love, there are two guitar intros. But it's very difficult for a, a right-handed player to play them, to pick it that way because I pick it backwards. And when a guitar player comes in the band, and it, well, I, I play those two intros, but they try and play it and they can't play it because it's, for me, for me, it's the right way for them. It's backwards. Their, their intuition tells them not to pick that way. So it gives me a, a different sound, you know. Well, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, let's talk about creativity. Um, mm. because you are, you know, a songwriter and, uh, really, I think you create the majority of the music for the band. Um, what does the yeah. creative process look like for you? I mean, do you get your, I, I mean, I've, I've interviewed all different, uh, people on the podcast and writers. Uh, Matthew Dix tells me that I can only write when I'm sitting behind a computer. He's a novelist. He's like, I can't. And my, I mean, I'm at the computer. I write the characters, tell me what to do. Uh, I've had right. people tell me I'm in the shower and, you know, you know, my ideas come to me that way. How do you get your ideas for the songs that you write? You know, I just, I just stop playing, but I, I know I, I get the, uh, the feeling that I'm going to write something, but I have no idea what it is. For instance, uh, today, as a matter of fact, this afternoon, I've, I've slotted that time out to write uh, at least one song today. We're recording in August for the first time in 13 years. And, you know, I have uh, like eight songs, but I, I pick today and tomorrow, and I'm going to sit down with the guitar and I'll write a song. And I, and I will but I have no idea what it's going to be or what it's about. But as soon as I start playing, I'll play some, a progression of some kind and I'll start singing something. And uh, whatever I start singing is the glue for the song and I build the story around it. But I never know what I'm going to sing, the melody with the guitar. Uh, but they both happen at the same time. I'll play something and I'll just start singing. And then I just, I see pictures and I'll go, oh, th this is about this person or that person or that place or whatever it's about. I just see it and, and I start telling that story. So it, it's kind of the same. You're talking about a novelist in front of a computer. For me, the computer is my guitar uh, or the piano. I write a lot on piano too, but I just sit down and start playing. But I'm not... I'm not a great guitar player and I'm certainly not a great piano player, but there's something that happens when I sit down and it's certainly a gift. I just stop playing stuff. Um, I can be at a sound check when we're with the band and I always come last, you know, I let the band do their thing. Then I'll, my guitar tech will give me my guitar and I'll start playing and the, and the band will say, what are you playing? What's that? And I'll go, I have no idea. But it, it, <laughs> happens. it happens all the time. And the good thing for me, though, is that I know it. I know it's going to happen. So it's not, oh, maybe. It's good. It happens every time. Uh, and it's certainly a gift. And I don't know where it comes from because I'm not trained in anything, you know. Uh, but it just happens. And I don't know how or why. But I love it. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's my whole being, you know. Well, it certainly sounds that way. I mean, it, I, I, I don't know why. I guess I thought I expected you to say, well, I'm inspired when I'm at the market and I see two people holding hands. Or, I, you know, I thought right. I was expecting something like that. So that really took me uh, off guard. That, well, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. It is a gift that it just comes naturally to you when you're in that setting. It is. It's a, definitely a gift. And, but I, the, the, the great treasure for me is knowing that. And, and I'm very, very grateful for it. Uh, you know, it, it's always been there. And 
I'm so thankful that I have that because it's given me everything. It's given me my dream when I was in my early teens of I wanted to be in a band, you know. And not only that, I wanted to write my own songs, uh, which I was doing at the time. But And it wasn't until I saw the Beatles when I was 14 where everything made sense. I went, oh, okay, now I get it. Uh, so it, that that creativity has given me everything. And, you know, I don't know why it was me. It could have been a million other people, but it wasn't, you know. Also, you did, you uh, wrote a publish, you published a poetry book. Um, yeah, so I've had three. I'm, I'm, my fourth one is coming out soon too. But, you know, that, I mean, I, I love poetry. I grew, grew up with that when at school, well, I, coming from England, you can't help but love the English poets. But uh, so I studied them at school and I just, then I started to write my own and I still do. But for me, that's part of music. It's, uh, you know, poetry uh, are, are lyrics without music. But for me, the music is there anyway. But when I, when I write a song, it's usually quite long and, and the, the lyrics are quite long too. So when the song's finished, I trim them all down, but I still have a lot of verses left that I'm not going to use. So I put them in a poem and it seems to work really, really well like that with me, you know. Oh my goodness, that's amazing. I heard you, you recently did a concert uh, where I think you even read some of your poetry during the concert. I do. I read, I read one poem, it's usually a different one, at every show. And I must give Russell uh, thanks for this, because he's, he really inspires me to do that. He says, because at first I thought, you know, I said to him, I'd really like to read a poem, you know. And he said, yeah, absolutely, you should. So I read it once, and he said, you should do it every night. But it, it's a weird thing. It's very dangerous, or it was at first, because you're in a rock and roll environment. And if we're in a five, 10,000 seat arena, it's noisy and they want to hear those big hits. And then suddenly everybody leaves the stage and I'm on my own. And I say to the crowd, I say, this is very unusual what I'm going to do, but I'm going to recite your poem and you can hear a pin drop. And I say, it's very short. And I say, I hope you enjoy it. And I play it. And it's complete silence for like three or four minutes. And afterwards, people stand up. So for us, it's a, it's a great moment. That, and I, but it's a part of what we are with, you know, the romantic idiom, if you like. It, it's a part of it for us. And Russell is so, he's so uh, great with it, you know. And I say, I, I don't want to hog up even three minutes of my own my own personal things on stage and he he says no you must do it he says now it's a part of the air supply plan now and so I do it you know and I think I don't think there's many artists that do that so no, it's nice to be, agree. <laughs> be kind of unique I did you know I went to see uh, Leonard Cohen and he is an incredible poet or was he's gone now of course but he did that during his show uh, but it was a little different. He had music playing in the back. And I thought, oh, wow, that's really cool. But so I do my version of that. And uh, people like it. And they like it a lot more than I thought they were going to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an amazing feeling. Not many poets get that instant gratification, so to speak, uh, that, that I think you're in this unique position to obtain right because you get to be on yeah. stage reading it and you get that immediate you know energy back from the crowd and and the, the yeah. sense of how much they loved it so that's another you know amazing thing that gets to happen for you that i think most poets don't get it is and um, you know as i said in the early times when i started to read a poem I, I never want to take advantage of the fact that it's an air supply show and i'm very i'm very conscious of that but people love it and after the show, they'll say, oh, I love this song or that song. Oh, and I loved your poem. So it's it earned its place, but I never want to take advantage uh, of anything 
for myself during an air supply show because air supply is always Russell and myself and I'm very aware of that and I never want to infringe upon that privilege you know now your songs have been played in major movies like The Wedding Date and Mr. and Mrs. Smith uh, yeah. right that there's just an iconic scene between Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie where your songs is playing. Do you remember yeah. seeing that scene for the first time? Or, I mean, I assume you've seen it. <laughs> I have seen it, but I must be honest. Uh, I knew it was coming because Russell told me the day before, he says, you got to go and see Mr. and Mrs. Smith. He says, he said, you're, you're going to freak out. There's a song in there. And, and so I saw it, and then when Brad Pitt started singing, I went, oh, my God, you know, because if, I mean, it's okay having the so songs in movies, and we've been, we've had a lot, we've been very fortunate, but if somebody like Brad Pitt is singing it, uh, that's different. And then there's, there was recently a one, I can't remember the name of the movie now, it was out last year, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the actor, famous actor, he, he dressed up as Spider-Man, kind of, do you know which one I mean? But I saw I saw that movie, and and the same thing happened. Somebody said you got to go and see this. I think it was the biggest movie last year, and he said, "You said you got to go and see the movie. All I'd love is in it." And I thought, "Oh, okay, maybe it'll be at the end where it usually is." Within the first three minutes of the movie. He's singing all out of love. And I'm going, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's that like? I mean, you create these songs and certainly you sing them within the, 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 you know, the vacuum of a studio, you know, environment. And then you go out into the world and you perform them at concerts. But it's mm -hmm. always, you know, you and your band doing that. What's it like yeah. to see it in this other forum, like in this other way, like to be sitting like the rest of us in a in a movie theater and suddenly see your music? I mean, that's got to be an amazing feeling. It's amazing, and it's happened a lot of times, but it's every time it's even more amazing, simply because it's a uh, it just tells you that the world loves what you're doing, you know, and so much. That they're going to put one of your songs in a movie and that's a, a great privilege but the great thing too is with, with us in particular we do get to go and play that song live where a lot of songs in movies might be from people that just write songs for movies but we get to play it so people get to hear it and uh, it's just a great a great privilege to hear it you know we go oh my god especially with songs you know all out of love and lost in love they're they're from the 80s you know so it's, it's a long time but people still want to put them in movies they're and, iconic and, and, yeah yeah Absolutely iconic, iconic. Yeah. yeah yeah you, you think, have, go ahead sorry you've had so many experiences uh amazing experiences you know uh, uh unparalleled by most people's career do you have and this may be unfair of me to ask so i'll apologize ahead of time do you have one moment that's forever etched in your brain as the most memorable moment in your career? Um, well, one of them we spoke of already is meeting and playing for Princess Diana and Princess Charles. Uh, there's been a lot of a lot of them, you know. I mean, one was when we played in um, in Cuba for the. I think we played there twelve years ago, and we'd always wanted to go there, uh, but playing there was such an incredible experience for us because it was a huge crowd um and you know we got there we sound checked at like five o'clock for an eight o'clock show and that the um not a tornado the hurricane was coming in hurricane dennis was coming in oh. and they said oh but we're, yeah we're gonna be okay you know you're gonna be okay so it started to rain about 7 30 we were going to go on in half an hour and the promoter came in and he said you know we, we are expecting fifty thousand people but he said uh they just keep coming there was almost three hundred thousand people there and we, we couldn't we didn't go on till two o'clock in the morning because the hurricane came in everything got drenched the winds were like 80 miles an hour and we were backstage going oh my god what's going to happen but suddenly the, the rain stopped and the wind abated. And we, he said, you got to go on now. So we went on, did the whole show. 
And then all these people, I've never seen anything like it. And then when we came off, the wind came up and the hurricane came back in full force. And there were cars being blown down the street. Mm. you know like like tumbleweeds and it was just an incredible experience and we said to ourselves this is one of those moments it'll never happen again you know so that that was definitely one for me wow uh yeah <laughs> do you and I know you probably get a tired of this, this question but do you have a favorite song that you've written is there one that uh is special for you well, you know, they all are, uh, but All Out of Love is, I think, my favorite song. It may not be the cleverest, or, but it, it's a, such a simple song. And um, plus, it was the first song I ever wrote on the piano. Uh, and I'm a terrible piano player, but I kind of get by. Uh, but I love that song because I know what it means to so many people around the world. Um, you know, we always close our show with it. And every time we play it, uh, it feels like the first time. I know that's very cliche, but it does because people wait for it. And when we start to play it, people are crying because of what happened to them, perhaps, you know, in the 80s. But it, it's a song that's transcended time. And I think if we're remembered for anything, maybe it'll be that song. I hope, you know, because it, it's a beautiful song and it's simple, but it has everything in it that you need when you want to listen to a song, in, in my opinion, you know. A Deadpool? Are you thinking of Deadpool? Yes, it's Deadpool. Yes. <laughs> I looked it up. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I, always, I can never remember the name of it because, but he dresses up like Spider-Man in that spider-ish come but uh yeah he came out and sang it and it was so so cool did yeah, you know ahead of time that did you know your song was in it ahead of time or are you just like watching it and going oh my goodness <laughs> I, I did know it was coming in uh russell again told me but i didn't know when and i presumed it was going to be in the middle or at the end of the movie but it was in the first two or three scenes it came in straight away and i went oh my god here it is <laughs> Uh, I mean, being a, a working, traveling, touring musician, things like that are icing on the cake, you know, and because being on the road is, it's not difficult, but it can be, it can be difficult sometimes. And, but when you get things like that, that happen, you go, oh, it's worth it, you know, it's worth getting bumped off a plane or getting stranded somewhere, you know. That's well, I mean, you're still doing about, a, I heard about 130 uh, shows mm. a year. I mean, that's still a grueling schedule to have on the road. <laughs> it is, yeah. And I mean, one of these days, we're going to start saying to our manager, uh, we don't want to do that, or we don't want to do that show. But, you know, he comes to us with, with every show, and we always say, yeah, we want to go, you know, I mean... Like, for instance, in October, I mean, especially now after COVID in October, uh, he came well, He came to us and said, do you want to go to Brazil in October? And we said, yeah, because Brazil's beautiful. And we haven't been there for three or four years. And we said, yeah, we'd love to go. And he says, OK, I got I got five shows in Brazil for you in different cities. And then he'll say, well, while you're down there, do you want to go to Chile and Argentina? And um, we'll say, yeah, well, let's do that at the same time. So suddenly you're on a three-week tour. Um, after we've said yes and it's all confirmed, we go, hmm, maybe we should have come home in the middle or something. But we do it, you know. Uh, the same with Australia. In, in December, we're going to Australia. So he said, well, let's do New Zealand, Indonesia, Singapore and Hong Kong. And we say, yeah, let's do it. It's, it'll be fun. But when we get there and actually in the middle of it, we go, hmm, we need, we need a day off, but we don't have one. Uh, and Russell and I always say, you know, we will say, we should have told him we didn't want to do this one. Um, and we will say, yeah, we always say that. But it never happens, you know. But it, it's part of being a musician, you know. You, it's, it's difficult and it gets more, the travel gets more difficult uh, uh, as, as you get older. But I think it's, you know, we get older and 
is just different, you know. Although we, we travel now a lot nicer than we used to, but it's still, you know, it's, it can be laborious sometimes. But, you know, we do it. It's part of everything. Is there something special when you perform in Australia? Is there, is there a, a... Yes. <laughs> yeah, I would think so, oh. like a coming home moment for you. Yeah, we played there five years ago and we played the Sydney Opera House, which is an iconic venue. And, you know, we had an orchestra with us and we really wanted to, to come back to where we began and play a great show. And it, it just happened that everything that night went off so perfectly. The orchestra was incredible. The place was packed. And, you know, we came out onto the stage at the beginning and everybody stood up. And we went, I was in tears. I thought, oh my God, this is incredible. Um, and it just happened to be the best show of our career. It really was. Wow. And, you know, it's moments like that and, you know, we're playing and, and singing during the show. And I'm thinking at the same time, wow, we're here uh, 47 years later. We're, we're still here and we're still doing our thing, like seriously. And I thought, wow, it, it's what, what a beautiful life. I, I don't deserve this great life, you know. Oh, well, you're, you're monstrously talented. Uh, so I think you've, <laughs> Very you've kind. more than deserve and have, have earned your, your place in uh, definitely rock and roll history uh, for certain. Um, oh, I mean, that's you, very you, kind of you. <laughs> you you've been uh, also awarded, I want to say BMI awarded you uh, for the most, mm. th th you know, however many you have to get to get the award, but for... Uh, yeah play you know play time on the radio of your music what was that like yeah to get that award i mean i have to believe that it was a pretty yeah. big moment it was i've had several i got my first one in 1980 uh for lost in love which it was record of the year song of the year and the most played song in the world at that time uh so i was like oh my god you know suddenly it's all happening and I've been very lucky since then. I've had a, a lot more of them. Uh, but we, we worked it out from, from the BMI plays. We worked, if a song is three minutes long, I've had enough plays that you could listen to Air Supply for 40 years nonstop. That's how many plays we've had. Do you know um, what I mean? Yes, I do know three, what you mean. <laughs> three minutes a song. And it, you, we could stack them for f over 40 years. But I must say something. Uh, bands like the Stones and the Beatles are way ahead, are way in front of that. But that's a long time, you know. We've had uh, uh, millions and millions of plays on the radio. And that, that's staggering. It really is. I think about that and I go, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and still till today, I mean... You're, you're, yes, you know, you, you, when you first came out in the eighties, you couldn't put the radio on without hearing your song, but you're still yeah. hearing your music today. As we pointed out, you're not only still hearing it on the radio, but you're still hearing it in movie theaters and, uh, I know. Yeah. yeah, and it's just, that, you're sold out. And, and when you tour, you're sold out. I mean, people are clamoring yeah. still to, to hear your music, both the, the original music and new music. They are. Yeah. You know, we always play a brand new song, always. And, you know, it's difficult to do that for any band. You know, Pete, that's when people go and buy a T-shirt or something. Uh, but uh, they sit and I'll tell them, say, yeah, I'm going to play your new song. Uh, have a listen. And, and they love it. And, you know, then I'll read a poem to them. And so I'm in dangerous territory. But it, it's not. It's... There's got to be a little danger sometime. You, well, for me, it, it's you've got to walk on treacherous ground. You know, that's what it's all about: trying new things, doing something that they may not like, but you soon find out. You know, but I love that we're able to do that. You know, in in among in amongst our set of all these big hits, then we'll put a brand new song in. And we what we massage it, what we call we we buffer it each side with a big hit. 
So they presume that that song is a big hit too. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's stage, stagecraft. <laughs> now, when you're creating new music today, do you feel yeah. in any way obligated to um, stick to your sound, right? You, you have a certain type of sound from the band. It's right. unique to Air Supply for certain. Mm -hmm. Do you always feel obligated to stick in, in the confines of that or, or no? Or do you feel like, uh, you know, I want to try something right. totally different? Well, I, the songs that I write, they're all very different. But when I write them on the guitar or the piano, I never know ultimately how they're going to sound in the studio. Uh, because it can go in several directions. But usually the songs that I write are of a they're of a familiar type you know i i play very kind of folky stuff on the guitar uh, but then when i put a melody to a simple progression it changes it and it puts it in another direction but i never know till the song's finished where i want to take it like i could make a simple folk song into something quite orchestral and it depends on a few things you know when i play the song to Russell, he'll say something, for instance, if I play him a folky thing that's really beautiful, he, he may say, oh, the band would be great on this song, where I'm thinking, oh, it should just be guitar and you and I. He'll say, oh, the band should play on that and it should be heavy there or it should be orchestrated. And I'll go, oh, okay, that's interesting. So we never know where it's going. But the, the first phase, like for me today, will be to, to write the song. Um, but I have no idea what it's going to be. And I love that. It's a blank canvas. And then suddenly the dots will appear and then I'll join the dots. But it's, it's such an exciting feeling, you know. Uh, and I tell myself a couple of days before, uh, you know, like yesterday uh, was like a holiday. So I didn't, I didn't do anything or Sunday. Uh, but I've been thinking, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write something today. And I will but I don't know what it is, but it's so exciting knowing that. And it, because it's like, it's like there's a Christmas present over there in wrapping with a big bow on it, but I can't open it until Christmas day. So I'll start to open it and unravel it and there'll be something there and I'll go, oh, wow, that's great. You know what I mean? It's, 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 so, it's so fun. <laughs> Well, it sounds, you make it sound fun. <laughs> well, and it it's is. very fun for you because when you sit down, actually good stuff comes out <laughs> if i went and sat down it, it does be fun. It, it, it'll be fun it's always fun and it, and it, it's always there but i'm sure one day it won't be but i don't know i don't see that day coming anytime soon you know <laughs> <laughs> are you still changing the material sometimes like in studio yeah we are uh as I said earlier, we, we're going to record in August for the first time in 12 or 13 years. Uh, and for the first time in a long time, uh, we're going to have somebody else produce the album. I, I want to step aside. Um, I, I just felt I wanted to this time. So we're having somebody come in that, that we chose that's going to work with us. And interestingly enough, we haven't worked with this person He's, he's quite a famous producer. We haven't worked with him. Not only that, we've never met him. But once again, you know, we've spoke on the phone, or I have, and I've got this rapport with him. But once again, it's that excitement, not knowing what he's going to do. But I'm, I'm going to give up control. I'm going to bring the songs in. And he's heard a lot of them, but I'm giving up control. So I'm excited for that, you know, because uh, he'll say, I'm sure, let's do this or let's try it that way. And I'm going to go, yeah, OK. <laughs> uh, so it's really exciting knowing that, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And bet is it is harder to get those exciting moments because you've done everything, right? It's hard. Yeah, to, yeah. it is. But, but we haven't recorded for 12 years or so. Uh, plus, you know, we always record live with the band. We don't we don't use computers 
or, or, or start off with a drum machine and then do that. I'm not into that. Uh, we do everything live. I never use a computer to write. I, I have a grand piano and a, my guitars, but we, we play live, you know, and that's the way we're going to do it. You know. I have to ask you before I can let you go, but can you remember the very first time you stepped out on a stage as the group Air Supply? Yes, I can. And we fortunately, we already had a big hit in Australia because we were in Superstar when we released our first single. And so people were anxious to see us live. And the, we left Superstar and the next week we, were, we played live for the first time. And it was an incredible feeling. And I'm sure it was really sloppy because we just put the band together, but it was Russell and I, and we were, we were on form, you know, our vocals were right there. And I was playing guitar, Russell was playing congas, and uh, <laughs> it, it was fantastic because it was loose, we weren't well rehearsed, but there was that seed there and you couldn't deny it. And everybody would come to us and say, wow, you guys sound great even though it was sloppy and unrehearsed but there was something there that we all felt and we we saw it and we could feel it so strong and and that's what that's what was the most important thing you know and of course let, that was uh 5300 shows ago so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean and did you name air supply together i mean who came up with the name well, we were in Superstar, and we had a record coming out, but we had no name. And now the record company, CBS, said, you've got to give us a name by tomorrow because we need to go to press with, with the single. And so Russ and I agreed, whoever came up with a name the next morning, uh, we would go with it if it was okay. And so the next morning, I said to Russell, have you got any names, you know? He says, no, I ain't got anything. He says, have you got anything? Well, I said, well, I had a dream last night. And this is a true story. I said, I dreamt of this big billboard. It was huge. And it was completely white. And on the perimeter of the billboard, all these lights were flashing like strobes and going off. Like, and in the middle of the billboard, in big black letters, it said, air supply. And I said, that's the only thing I have. And he said, hmm, said, okay, we got to go with it. And that's how we got the name. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, it's a true story. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can, can you remember then actually seeing, I mean, you must have seen billboards. Oh, I can remember the dream. As, I can remember it as vividly as it was last night, yeah. It and was, then to I see it come to to see it come to fruition. I mean, you must have seen your name on in on real billboards after that, after the dream. I mean, wasn't that oh, surreal? I did. Yeah, it was it was bizarre because the dream was so vivid and like boing, you know. But when we were in 1983, uh Arista Records, we had the greatest hits out, and they had a billboard on Sunset Boulevard. And it was huge and it had lights all around it. And in the middle, it said air supply and it had a picture of Russell and I from the greatest hits. And every week they would change the figure of how many units were sold that week. And it started, you know, 300,000 and it kept going and it went past two, three, four million. Every week it would go there. And, and we would drive, we'd say, let's take a drive down Sunset and see that bloody billboard. And there it was, as large as life, with like four or five million copies of the album sold. So seeing the, knowing the dream and then seeing it live is, it just tells you that anything is possible. And that's, that's the big takeaway for me, coming from where I came from, you know, with no phone, no car, no, nothing. And then seeing that anything is possible. If you, you got to believe in it, you know. And do you get, I mean, I imagine you've got a lot of songwriters and artists who ask you for advice through the years. Do you have mm. one 
one piece of advice you could give somebody young and starting out? They, they do ask me that. And I say, always say the same thing. I'll say, you've got to believe in yourself because if you don't, how can you expect anybody else to do that? You know, from, from when I was, I know I started writing songs when I was 13 and they were terrible songs, but there was something there. And I used to say to my friends, I'd say, I, I want to play you a song. And, and they'd sit and listen to it and they go, oh, wow, that's really cool. I mean, it was terrible, but I, I got confidence from people like that. But you've got to believe in yourself, you know, you've got to have confidence because people, certainly in the music industry, they're ready to knock you down, you know. They're ready to knock you down and step forward. But I don't let people do that, you know. Not not with with, with my songs, you know. Not now, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a mentor? Uh, I, I, I have, and I am now, too. There's, there's a, 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 a young lady that's just 17 years old, and she has a wonderful story. I'm not going to bore you with it now, but she has a wonderful story, and I'm kind of helping her out. She's an excellent, a gifted songwriter, so I'm guiding her down the path, not doing anything with her, like as far as co-writing, but I'm trying to guide her and let her avoid the pitfalls of, of the business, which, uh, which there are, you know. When you were young, who was your favorite artist? Oh, the Beatles. Yeah. <laughs> right um, away. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny. All, I have my favorite songwriters, uh, and they're all born within a few days of myself. So I feel very fortunate to be in that group in my head. You know, my favorite songwriters are Paul McCartney, Bob Dylan. And Roy Orbison. And oh my goodness! They're yeah. all, they're all, they're all June birthdays, and I love that. <laughs> well, there must yeah. be something about it, right? <laughs> that you're all so talented. I think, <laughs> I think it's either a coincidence or there's something going on with that kind of thing. Funnily enough, you know, I, I lost my mother when I was ten years old, and that had a profound effect on me and sent me in this direction, but. Both John Lennon and Paul McCartney had the same event happen to them in their childhood. You know, they both lost lost their mothers. Yeah, um, so I oh, think that right. had a lot to do a lot to do with it too. You know, sure, our life experiences do kind of build up and 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 mold us, right, and make us who we are. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's it's all about those experiences, and you know. I, I just finished my autobiography, but oh really? Um, oh, yeah, I did. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, what it did for me, uh, I mean, I didn't write it because I wanted to write a book. I want there are certain events that I knew of in my childhood that I wanted to write down before I forget them and before I have before I lose that clarity, and I started to write them down, and then there were so many that they started to get to take a shape. So I ended up writing the book. But what was most important to me was uh, it brought back all those memories and it brought back those times that were very difficult. And, and I, I relearned how I navigated through them and to make the person that I am. Uh, and it was really very interesting for me. I, I don't think anybody had any interest in reading it. But I, I, I disagree. <laughs> I disagree. Uh, well, we'll see. But it's, uh, you know, I had a very difficult childhood and very emotionally distraught and a lot of weird things happened. But I, I came through it because, because of, I had great friends, even as a young teenager, great friends. And, and I believed in, in myself and I thought I could do it. You know, I thought I could make it. And you know, here I am all these years later. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm very excited to get to read the book. I'm, I'm kind of an obsessive reader, so I'm going to be... Uh, oh, are you? Yeah. Oh, good. So I probably read yeah, about two, well, weeks, two uh, books a week, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, I used to be the same before I 
before air supply started. I was the same. I, I, uh, for a living, you know, I used to play in folk clubs, uh, earning just do- a few dollars, five dollars a night. But in the day, I, I was a voracious reader and I would read the same books and I just loved it. And, you know, when, I, when we're on planes, we were talking about travel. When we're on planes now, I do look forward to being on a plane, especially on a long flight. And I'll take two or three books on, on the flight with me. And I'll usually get through at least one. And I just love it because, you know, people will bring you a cup of tea and a sandwich and I can just read for eight hours. And I love it. <laughs> I love that too. That's to me, that's, that's, that's like a vacation, a cup of tea and a book. Uh, wow. Oh, yeah, I love it too. I'm glad you're of the same ilk. That's great. So now I'm going to be looking for your book. I, I can't wait. You got me very excited. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, I'll let you know. I'll let Steve know when, when it's coming out. Yeah. It's being edited right now, but I think you might enjoy it. I hope somebody enjoys it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think a lot of people are going to enjoy it. I mean, there's still there's still uh, hundreds of like even Facebook pages dedicated and Facebook groups dedicated to, to you and your band and your music. So you're still very much in the I know I get, for information yeah, about it's, you guys. It's amazing. What, what a great life I have, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> You do. You'd be hard pressed to argue against that. (laughs) So I have a question. I have a question for you, Tony. How do you look so fresh and happening this time in the morning? (laughs) (laughs) Well, you flatter me, but I'm I'm an attorney. I've been an attorney most of my career, so I'm used to being up very early and having to be ready. Oh, oh, well, well, you look fantastic. You look really (laughs) beautiful. Oh, thank you. That's such a kind thing to say, especially, I mean, that'll make my day. I'll be running around telling everybody, do you know Graham Russell said I look great? (laughs) (laughs) It's true. So thank you. Thank you. And I know I kept you way past time. I know you have another. So I really appreciate your time so much. I I was very excited. I could hardly sleep last night. I was so excited that I was going to get to talk to you in the morning. I've been a lifelong fan. So this was really an honor. Oh, Oh, where do you, where are you based? If I may ask. New Jersey. Oh, okay, cool, cool. I think we. Have you seen us live before? I ha- I didn't. I just found out that you were here, <laughs> a few, you right? Know, recently, and I didn't know. Um, oh, okay. I wish I had gotten the chance to see you guys live. Next time, you're going to pay more attention. Next time, you're back this way, uh, New York, New Jersey area. I, I definitely want to see you. Yeah, I think we're coming mm-hmm. back in like a month or something. So have a look. But if you're if you're coming to a show, let me know. Let Steve know, and we'll get you tickets. And I'd love to meet you in person. Oh, likewise. This has been so delightful to get an opportunity to sit and talk to you and to talk about how you create. I mean, some of just the most amazing songs I think ever written. Uh, oh my! Just to now see. you're flattering me. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's how I feel. I mean, there's so much to, as you said, both the the music, you know, and the lyrics uh, to everything you've written. Uh, I've always loved the music. I, I I have so many of your CDs. Uh, now, of course, they're on oh, my. Wow. Phone. Oh, cool. No one has CDs anymore. Right now, I download them to my phone just to have some of my favorites that I carry with me. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so I, I think to get an opportunity to talk to you about how you've created it, which surprised me, uh, it really, it was an honor. Thank you uh, so much for being here. Oh, Tony, it's my pleasure. Thank you. I've been looking forward to it, too. And I and hope I'm, I'm book- glad we were. Oh, yeah. I, I'm glad we were able to spend more time and not just a, a few minutes, you know. And I hope when your book comes out, you'll come back and talk to me about your book. Oh, I would love to. That is a day. For sure. <laughs> Thank you. All Thank right, you Tony. so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Tony, and have a lovely day. You too. Bye. Bye bye.